So welcome to the podcast, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So share your story. I would love to have the listeners hear your story and how you got into fertility coaching and coaching in general. Yeah. So my coaching in general actually started um, when I was 30. I had just gotten divorced. We had gone through three plus years of marriage counseling. And my husband at the time kept saying like, this is divorce counseling. Like this is not helping us to stay married. They're not giving us any tools. They're basically, you know, we're, we're going in for an hour every week and leaving and not getting it much better. And I kept thinking like, he's kind of right. There's nothing concrete that's been given to us. Um, I, at that same time, coaching was just starting to become a thing in California. We always joke, like you have a life coach and you eat sushi out here. And, um, it was kind of a trendy thing at the time, but I've always been a very a black and white person. Like give me the tools in order to fix something or do something, whether that was losing weight or, you know, ha- trying to do a new habit or something. And so it just felt like a right move for me to help people in situations that I had been through in order to help them move forward. So I became a certified um, ICF life coach in 2006 Mm -hmm. and had been doing that on the side of my previous job or still my job, I shouldn't say previous, but of event marketing and corporate. So I have those two businesses that I had done all those years. Throughout those years, I had also worked with people that were often old than I was and had said, you know, I had seen their fertility issues as well as um, them saying to me, knowing that I had just gotten divorced, like you should freeze your eggs and be aware of what's happening um, going forward. If you're not, you know, going to be trying to have a baby at any time soon, mind you, I was never that person that was like burning yearning for a child. I was much more career driven at that time. Um, but as anything, you know that age is an issue. And so I went to the fertility doctor at age 30 and said, I'd like to freeze my eggs. And at that time he said, you're too young. Eggs don't thaw well, come back later. So 36 came along and I was still single. I went back to him and I said, I'd like to freeze my eggs. And he said, okay, we'll do it now. They still don't thaw well, but you know, your 36 year old eggs or your 36 year old eggs and your let's just do it anyway. So we retrieved 13 eggs and thawed, I'm sorry, froze 11 at that time. Um, And then at age 39, I started having very heavy periods and became really uncomfortable and I knew something is wrong. I went to my OB and they found some fiber fibroids. They told me that the fibroids were small and basically sent me on my way saying it was no problem. My gut feeling knew that there was a problem. So I went back to that same RE and I said, can you please take a look and just see what's happening? Because they said it's not a problem, but I feel like it is. My periods are just way too heavy. And he said, absolutely, it's a problem. They're in the lining where you would need to implant. So your chances of having a baby are probably unlikely because of where they are. So he recommended I go see a gynecological oncologist to have them removed. And for all my clients now, I also tell them to do the same if they have one in their area, mainly because they have the most up-to-date robotic equipment to make sure that there's the least amount of scar tissue left after a surgery. Mm -hmm. And they're obviously very well aware of all the women parts down there. Um, so whether it's looking at fibroids or if you have a cyst or endometriosis, I always recommend, please go to see somebody who specializes in this rather than an OB to do your surgery. Um, because the scar tissue could then become another, um, issue that you wouldn't want to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I had that removed and, um, at that point, my recovery from that, I think was six months that they said you needed to wait to try to conceive. But at the same time, they said, you're now 40. If you, this is what you're going to do. You need to do it now. So I, I did it the first time and we got pregnant and that's my, you were at that point remarried. Yes. So in between, (laughs) in between getting the fibroids and the surgery and whatever, I met my husband who I had known previously. So it was a very fast situation. 
And at that time it was like, okay, hi, how you doing? Let's get married. And by the way, if we're going to try to have a baby, we're doing it now. (laughs) (laughs) So luckily he was on board, but it was very like, you know, fire hose type of situation of like all very quickly. So yes, I did have my, I got married my second time at 40. So I was Mm -hmm. single from 30 to 40 and basically didn't meet my second husband until 39. So all of my 30s. So the reason why I say that again is because I can relate to all the women now, especially during COVID who are still single and wondering, you know, what to do and, or is solo motherhood an option for them? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've been there and I think it's definitely something to consider these days as well. There's so many people doing it and you're not alone and it's really a good option. So, so, um, so walk us through the whole, um, story, the journey after that. Okay. Yes. So it continues (laughs) of course, after that. So, um, I had a not so easy pregnancy with my first one, but, but fine. Um, and then shortly so the, after, so was it a natural pregnancy or, or did you use the frozen eggs? No, that was natural. So I basically, all I needed to do was remove those fibroids and that was what was preventing pregnancy before. And so mm-hmm. that opened that up and it worked. So I kind of thought, okay, we checked the box off, right? That was, that was the issue. It's no longer an issue. And here we go. Um, my second pregnancy, I miscarried. So that really hit me like a ton of bricks because I, I was very naive and thinking, you know, it happened for us the first time. Right. Um, no problems, no issues. I was 41 when I gave birth to my first son. So I was, I think just either 41 or 42 at that first miscarriage. Um, I felt like, okay, I am now one of the statistics. I still couldn't really get my head around the fact that it happened to me, honestly, even though I knew I was 42 and the chances of that were, you know, pretty high. It just never really came into my head that Mm -hmm. it would happen for me. I didn't know, none of my family had had a miscarriage. None of my friends had had a miscarriage. Um, Nobody I knew at least nobody that had told me about it. So this is, you know, part of the awareness now that I want to bring out is because once you start talking about it, then you hear everybody else say, oh, I had one, I had one. And I was like, why didn't anybody tell me this before? You know, Um, then I wouldn't have felt so alone and ashamed and, you know, all the things. Um, So again, given my age, I felt this very um, kind of an added stress around trying to have this baby because I knew I didn't have a lot of time. So I was by Ari, I had worked through, he had uh, watched me through the first and second pregnancy and the pregnancy that I had lost. Um, And so he was aware of the fact that, okay, we know you can get pregnant despite your age and everything, because we did the fibroid surgery. Um, He said, I don't really think that you need my help. But in my mind, I felt like I did need help because I didn't have the time as I saw every month, not getting pregnant and doing all the things I felt like we needed help because we didn't have the time. Um, so after that second mar- miscarriage, we were ready to do IVF. We did all, you know, we had our baseline done. We had all the medication ordered, ready to pick up at the pharmacy. I went in to do my blood work that morning. You usually go in around 7 a.m. and then they call you around 10 or 11 to say your levels are good, you're ready to go, whatever. Um, So that 10, 11 o'clock call I got from him was, well, guess what? You don't need to pick up your medications. You're pregnant. I was floored. I couldn't believe that this, yeah, I like, it was like a miracle to me. I couldn't even believe it. Um, So of course I was so excited again, because of the relationship I had with him, he always monitored my pregnancy. So I was very lucky in that. So even though I had no assistance from him because we had this relationship and he had, you know, been with me, I, I was still able to go weekly to do the, the heartbeat and, Mm -hmm. you know, all the updates and everything. So, um, that's at that point, Yeah, I was very lucky. At that point, though, because I had had the first miscarriage, 
the PTSD had started to set in, right? Mm -hmm. So it was no longer the same experience that I had with my first baby of like easy breezy, no idea, like I said, very naive of every appointment that I had going to watch on the monitor was like, it's going to be good news. What are we going to see on our baby today? And, you know, now it was panic was setting in and stress every time we would go there of like, okay, I could feel, I'm not an anxiety type person, but I could feel it sitting out there in the waiting room of please God, let there be a heartbeat. Please God, let this be okay. Um, so I, I should back up to say during my first DNC is when I decided that I was meant to be helping others with this process. Um, and I'll back up to that in a minute, but part of what we do now often with the miscarriage support is carrying them through their next pregnancy so that they don't have to have that same experience that I had had. Um, because it is a real thing. The PTSD post Mm -hmm. miscarriage is, you know, unbelievable. Even if you're doing all the things right, it's really literally out of your control. Yeah. Um, so we went through that, which would have been third pregnancy, I guess. And everything was fine during that third pregnancy. I have, uh, my two and a half year old now, um, healthy baby boy again. Um, and then during the second pregnancy, I knew our family needed to be a three child family. I can't tell you how I knew that. I just had this knowing and I would tell my husband, I don't know, we need to do this, not because of what it means for me, but for them and their life. And, you know, I grew up with four sisters. I wanted them to have each other and have that Mm -hmm. experience. And it was really important to me um, because I just had this knowing that we needed to do that. Mind you, now I'm 42 and a half, I think. And all of this time, I actually thought I was a year younger than I was, (laughs) that I didn't realize until my last baby when we were at the doctor and I, my husband saw me write that I was 42. He's like, you're not 42, you're 43. And I was like, what are you talking about? (laughs) He's like, you're 43. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So that's not counting after 40. (laughs) I know, but I do think that was another angle that helped me to get through it is I never really put the age on. Oh, I love that. That's so good. (laughs) Yeah, I I honestly felt like I don't care what anybody else is telling me. People would tell me all the time, even strangers who would hear about our situation or see me like, you really shouldn't be trying, like, why would you even try? Because you're Mm -hmm. not going to have a healthy baby if it makes it. And I remember thinking like, I can't even believe people are telling me this. Yeah. But I never took on that societal, you know, number of what we should do. And I often tell people as much as you can just know your body. If your body Mm -hmm. is healthy and you have, you know, the faith that you're doing all that you can do and you have your fertility team with your acupuncturist and you're doing your supplements and your exercise and eating well and your mental work, you should be okay. You know, there's women that are in their twenties and thirties that are having losses. And that's really what I told myself all the time. Yes, this is happening to me, but it's also happening to younger people. Mm -hmm. So who's to say that, it's because of my age. I really did not buy into that. That's great. So fast forward through additional losses. And finally, our last baby that we, I had some complications with the last um, DNC where there was some tissue left over. So I had, again, bleeding from the the DNC more so than I had had before, which again, they're not our, all are created equal, but my gut feeling was something was wrong. I was on the medication that's supposed to stop the bleeding and it was not. I was waking up in the middle of the night with my bed soaked with blood and it was just something was not right. And this was after a couple months that it was still going on. So despite my amazing relationship with my RE at the time, I felt like I really needed to go get a second opinion. And as hard as that was, because I had such a great relationship with that clinic and him, it was what I needed to do for Mm -hmm. peace of mind to just get to the bottom of what was happening. Um, And sure enough, I had fetal tissue left in my uterus. And so that's the continued bleeding was basically not going to stop until that had cleared. So I had 
baby number one, mm-hmm. D and C was fine. Mm-hmm. Baby number two, mm-hmm. who's my two and a half year old, no problem. Right. Then I had another miscarriage. So during that time, so they did a hysteroscopy where they filled the uterus with liquid water to see what was in there. And that's where they saw the tissue. At that time, they had said, you can do another DNC, which to me, I was so emotionally like drained at that point. I just, I couldn't really bring myself to do it. So we waited a little while to see if we could get it to pass just by, you know, normal ways with the medication and whatever. And it did. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had my next baby, which is my last son. Okay, um, so here we are with three boys. Um, and I, I say the three boys because in part of that journey, I always say there's a lot of work that I did on my um, mental health and spiritual life during that point of seeing like, why were these losses coming to me? These losses were also girls. I came from all girls. I wanted a girl so bad. Um, And, you know, why, why was that happening? So I did a lot of work. And the reason I bring that up is if you have a feeling that there's something else that's, you know, part of this journey, I always say, look within and is there something that you need to do to heal that? Is it um, like cord cutting work? Is it past life regression type of work? Is there something else that you're bringing forward that might either be preventing you from conceiving or carrying a baby to term or whatever? And it's not for everybody, but for me, it really did help me to heal a lot and to understand what was going on with me. And I only say that if anybody's open to, to looking at that through their journey. And what was it, what it, did that look like for you? Like what was, what you learned or kind of figured out and discovered yeah. about yourself? Yeah. So I knew that I, I was, you know, the last of girls. So I was never, my name was supposed to be Scott. I was always told you were supposed to be our boy. You are our last chance for a boy. All we wanted was a boy. Mm. Like that's all I ever heard growing up. So for me, trying to align with my parents and my mom more so's approval, so to speak of, you know, wanting to show up in a way that always knowing that you never really felt good enough showing up as a girl, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, when I, I carried that on to the next, so the girls weren't, you know, quote unquote, good enough in a way. And so therefore I was producing these boys that were the stronger ones to carry through in order to, to kind of pull out what I was supposed to be, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to get my head around the fact that you know, we are all on our own paths and we're all here on our own destiny. We all have our own free will, but I didn't realize I had so much healing to work through around knowing that I was good enough that I showed up as a girl on this planet, you know, even though my parents, my family wanted a boy so badly. And now I'm able to love these boys so much to say like, you are worth it. You are wanted. You are so loved, you know, no matter how, you know, but no matter what you end up being like. um, And so it was a really good experience for me to work through a lot of that, to Mm -hmm. realize I, I wasn't aware how heavy that was for me until I was going through this process on my own. And I was able to clear some of that and accept, um, you know, that, that no matter what I had, it was okay. Mm -hmm. And what modality really connected with you or helped you the most through that? So I did a lot of um, past life regression. I did a lot of that. I did a lot of something called Psych K, which mm-hmm. is- I've heard of that. Yeah, it's um, super powerful, as well as just a lot of writing and inner child work to to really get to um, feeling like not recognize, because I had a good childhood. I, I never really consciously thought about it until I really focused on, on that and how it made me feel and just the knowing of what our family dynamic was and everything. So yeah, again, I only say that if there's healing to be done in anyone else's, because oftentimes as anything, 
what we're going through is often connected to our childhood or something mm-hmm. else. And it's all, all healing all together and bringing a life into this world, especially in that womb center and your femininity. A lot of times that does need some healing in one way or another, whether that's from past relationships here or, you know, in our childhood work or whatever, it's really important to do. It is. And, um, Bruce Lipton talks about how under seven, we're basically like walking, talking um, hypnosis experiments yes. because we just absorb everything that we're being told. And you bring up such a good point because you're saying that you had a great childhood. It's not like you had any kind of bad events. You had a loving upbringing, but even with that and, and the, the fact that they did have a good intention, even them just kind of joking around about it or kind of mentioning it. Yes. And it's not meant with bad intent, but look how interesting how when you're a child, you absorb that information. And even though it's well-meaning, it can still really enter deep into your own identification and how, and and children automatically kind of feel like things are their fault. It's kind of a weird thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did a lot of mourning around that when I realized it because I it made me so sad. It made me so sad for that little girl that felt like she didn't she didn't show up the way they wanted her to as a boy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was very healing. But I love Bruce Lipton. I love the biology Amazing. of belief. Yeah. I tell everybody who's having a baby, please read that book before or listen to the audio before you have a baby. Just so you understand the significance of the epigenetics and and ever the words that you use for your children too. So. Oh my God, it's so powerful, like so powerful. But what I find so fascinating about your story is that many people would kind of say, oh, well, you know, nothing bad happened, so I don't need to address it. So to actually realize and validate yourself as a child to understand what you went through is is really powerful because I think a lot of people would almost dismiss it. Absolutely. And part of that is, you know, if you are doing any sort of cognitive behavior work while you're trying to conceive, you're up to 60% more likely to conceive. Mm-hmm. So this is all part of that. And in part of that is, you know, coming back to your inner self, your inner childhood, your higher self, whatever it is that you feel like you need to address and work on and making sure that your adrenals are always calm, your cortisol levels are, you're balanced and everything is good. Because when you are in that position, you allow the openness for you to conceive a little Mm -hmm. more easily. Now, granted, you need to be doing the other things as long as well as, and that's why I always talk about your fertility team so much because it all makes such a big difference. I mean, you know, you can't have a crew boat rowing with only one person rowing. You, if you have everybody going the same direction, you're going to get there faster and easier and more successfully. And that's why I always refer to the fertility team. Yeah, I love that fertility team. I say it takes a village because, um, and it's interesting because I have other experts. I have um, somebody that's local that does um, fertility psychotherapy. I have a hypnosis. I do hypnosis, but I don't do as much regression because that's a whole other specialty. So if it's something that's really deep that needs to kind of get extracted or released, then I send them to her and it's, it really takes a team and with that team, people do so much better. For sure. And it's such a heavy experience to trying to have a baby, especially if you're, you know, if you're struggling with it, obviously that if you, if you're one of those that gets so lucky as my mom would always say, like, all I needed to do is drink the water and I would be pregnant. That wasn't the case for me, but you know, if you are one of those that every month you're peeing on the sticks and you get that disappointing negative test, it's so helpful to start looking inward and doing some of that self-care and healing because it's a very heavy journey. You Mm -hmm. can find joy in it for sure. And it's a matter of trying to, when you get into those low points, not staying in the low points because you want to have your vibration high as you, as high as you can during Mm -hmm. this process again, because that's what opens up your energy to conceive. In speaking to people, about just over the years, I find that that's probably one of the biggest challenges. So they're in, and you know, you've been through it, you know, when you're in that vibration of fear, 
Mm -hmm. um, anxiety, PTSD, trauma. Um, it's really hard to get yourself out. And then you feel like kind of this guilt about not being positive. And, you know, so it's kind of, it, it almost feeds itself into this cycle. And I find that I think that the biggest question people have is how do I get myself out of that? How do I switch gears? Absolutely. Especially trying to conceive, right? Because that's, everybody knows, don't stress. If you're stressed, you're not going to get pregnant. Well, yeah. I remember literally saying to myself, like, how can, like, it's this circle, right? Yeah. I'm stressed. I know I'm not supposed to be stressed, but I'm stressed about being stressed because right. yeah. it's not going to totally. work. Totally. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that's where the tools that come in from the coaching really like come into play because that's where I go back to when I started coaching. It's giving somebody the tools in order to move forward with that. So they can say, okay, I'm getting into this negative spiral right now. I'm falling into this trap, whether that's again, a negative test, or you thought you were going to be ovulating that day or that month and it, you know, you never got the peak or the surge or whatever it is for you, whatever it may be that kicks you into that spiral, or maybe you saw a pregnancy announcement or something. It's really like automatically finding what is, is for you to start to switch it off, to go the other way. So it's, it looks different for everybody. Some it's cooking or baking, you know, mm -hmm. like right away, I'm going to go to start to make, look for a recipe or start to make something for others. It's I got to get up and go for a walk. For others, it's I'm going to journal this right now. Mm -hmm. So as soon as your brain starts to trigger down that negative spiral, you know exactly what you're going to do right then. You know, mm -hmm. you may be in a situation where you can't go for a walk or you can't journal or whatever, but if you make a note to it in your phone or something, so again, you're triggering your brain to switch to the other side. So it fires on one side. And as soon as it does that, you start the firing to the other direction mm -hmm. and having that awareness of have your brain, how your brain literally is working, makes you aware to say, I'm going to make this conscious decision to do this because then my brain is going to start to move that direction. And slowly you'll learn that you don't stay in those negative spirals as long. Again, it's not mm -hmm. going to, you know, be a magic thing that happens and you're not going to not be stressed, but your times of stress are going to be less. And all of my clients, the word they use over and over is I just feel more calm. Mm -hmm. I'm calm about the process. I'm calm about the outcome. I just feel calm now. Whereas before I was so stressed and had so much anxiety and now I, my brain is calmer. And that's because we really do work through tools that work for each person and it's specified to each one because everybody's different. Some people love affirmations. Some people love meditation. Some people mm -hmm. don't. So you have yeah, to find what works true. for you. Otherwise yeah, everybody you're wasting has your time. A different key, a different language, a different um, something that they relate to. And what's interesting too, is just about anxiety in general, like when you're in the state, it almost feels like you, you need to be, you cling on to the state because you feel like it's a security. Like if you let go, it's a weird thing, but Eckhart Tolle says it, that worry pretends to be productive or it, it pretends to keep you safe, but it's, it doesn't, but it's, the, it's kind of an interesting thing because when you're in it, you almost don't think you have a choice until Absolutely. little by little you, you use different tools. And then little by little, you start to realize that you actually do have a choice. And not only do you have a choice, but the, I guess the pull or that um, that grip that those emotions have over you start to dwindle or the thoughts that you identify with. Absolutely. I think that's such a great point that you bring up because you don't even realize sometimes that it's happening. And once I think people see the visual of what how the brain does work, they're able to see like, okay, it's firing on this way all the time, right? And that's my negative thoughts. So I literally need to switch it. And I always say, give the thoughts in your brain equal time. So if you're going to say this retrieval isn't going to work, say this retrieval is going to work. Mm -hmm. There's no reason that we can't say both because we don't know, right? right. We don't know that it's not going to work. We don't yeah. know if it is going to work. So give them equal thoughts for as long as possible. Or, you know, my, I'm going to have 10 eggs. What if I don't get 10 eggs? What if you do get 10 eggs? So I, I always say, just try as hard as you can 
you, if you feel like you have to have the negative thoughts, which most people in this case, it's very hard for them to walk away from it altogether. And I get that I've been there, but just give them equal time on the other side. And slowly you'll recognize that it gets easier and easier and easier. And then your outcome is different. And then once your outcome is different, you realize like, oh my gosh, it worked, right? Mm -hmm. I get these calls all the time of, you know, I can't believe it. I've, I'm, my transfer took, I can't believe it. My egg retrieval, you know, I have six fertilized, you know, normal embryos. I can't believe it because they didn't have that before. And it's just, it's not that we're like doing miracles, but going through the process and helping that, that's why you're up to 60% more likely. That is the work. And those are the results that come from it. Because as much as we also focus on, you know, your body lifestyle and health, we also focus a lot on the, the mindset. Absolutely. And another important topic that we were talking about before is miscarriage. And, you know, the fact that there's shame around it or people don't want to talk about it and they're afraid yes. to, and, and it, it happens. So it happens frequently. It happens a lot more frequently than people realize. Um, and it's just so important to kind of open that dialogue so that people feel like they can connect and express themselves freely. And what I find too is interesting is that, you know, in every loss that we have, um, of people that we know, we have mm-hmm. ceremony, we have community, mm-hmm. but this is the one loss that a lot of people have to experience alone. And they don't really get to have mm-hmm. that community. They don't really have that sacred ceremony and, and kind of goodbye. And so, and I know that you do a lot of work around this. So I wanted to, yes, get I that. think it's so important because to your point, if we have a loved one that has been lost, we usually also know why they passed, right? We have mm-hmm. an answer. Yeah. Most of the time with a miscarriage loss, we don't get an answer. Even with a stillborn, there's many times that they don't know, you know, mm-hmm. they were healthy until 20 weeks. They were healthy until 36, 39 weeks, and then it happens. And so the also not having the answer is really hard to come to terms with. And, Mm -hmm. and also most people after a loss, they still want to build their family. And so how can they build their family, allowing space to not only honor the pregnancy and the baby that they had, but also feel safe to move forward and trust Mm -hmm. their body that it's possible without knowing an answer. And that takes a lot of work sometimes to get through because, because it is, you're dealing with, things that are out of your control. So you don't know what it is that you're going to be able to do next that can do this or not do this. And really, we, again, we go back to tools of honoring and figuring out what is going to work for you. What is going to bring comfort for you? What is going to bring stability for you specifically and making you feel safe because it's different for everyone. I always say whatever time your losses have some sort of ceremony or commemorative um, jewelry or flower or tree or plant or whatever it means to you um, to know that every time this azalea blooms, it's reminding me of my daughters that are there. Or every time I look at my ring, it's reminding me of those babies that I lost. And for some people, you know, the the everyday reminder is not what they want. For some people, they get tattoos because they want to see that everyday reminder. Mm-hmm. Everything is what you need it to, to be, but it's also so important to grieve that. The loss of a baby is so powerful because of all those things that go around. Like I just said, we can't really wrap our head around it. You know, you feel like if this was meant to be, why was it taken away from me? Mm-hmm. Um, and with, uh, without any explanation. I think that that's what it is. Yeah. For it's, sure. It's, it's trying to make sense of, uh, you can't make sense of it. Right. And how do you come to terms with something you can't make sense with? And that's why we really go through a lot of tools. I have a 30 day support plan of, you know, journaling prompts to really get you to dig deep into that so that you can work through this because working through the grief and healing your heart allows you to be again, more open to going on with your family and creating the dream that you want. Yeah. 
So important, um, but such an important topic. So I have a question for you. So now that you know what you know today, because you've learned mm -hmm. so much and you've really taken your journey to help so many other people, um, which I think is beautiful. And I think it's so healing yeah. as well. Yes, thank you. And um, so if you can go back to yourself when you were really going through the loss, the PTSD, what would you tell her? That this too will pass. You know, this too will pass. It will be okay. Trust and surrender. And I think surrender for me is such a hard concept to get. It always has been in many different ways, but really it is, is surrendering to the higher power of you are exactly what you're, where you're meant to be. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize at that time that everything that I was going through, even the experience that I had with my RE when he was saying, you know, you don't really need to be here, but I was going through it. Um, makes me be able to say, I've sat in that seat. I know what it's like to be there that all these women are going through. I, I did do my IVF at 36 on my own. I did have all these experiences and I would just tell myself, just, it will be okay. This is a moment in time, surrender to the experience and, and just trust the process. Yeah. I know it's uh it's so hard for all of us, even the ones that are seasoned and because yes. it's the unknown. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's for everything in our life, right? I right. mean, with your career, <laughs> with your relationships, whatever it may be. I mean, it's all it's all a bigger picture of surrendering to the universe. Absolutely. It is. Um, so for people who want to work with you, how can they find you? At elizabethking.com on my website, as well as on Instagram at elizabethking underscore coaching. Awesome. This was great. I think we hit on certain points that are so important to talk about. I don't feel like they're talked about enough. And I think that there's yes. such healing for people who have gone through this and that get to listen to your story. And that really just the fact that it's out, it really, you know, wounds heal when they're just, when they're, when they can breathe. A hundred percent physically and emotionally, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for coming on. This is great. Thank you.